Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word this morning, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for revelation of it. We thank you that we're taking hold of it. We will be doers of the word and see the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We've been sharing with you for some time on the subject of God's spiritual work being accomplished in your life. And today we're going to talk about another aspect, and that is obtaining the precise, correct spiritual knowledge of God, which must be obtained by every believer in Jesus Christ. It is absolutely essential. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. We've talked about the spirit of might, how we get empowered within so that we have released the power of God with mighty force and accomplished the great works of the Lord. Well, today we're going to talk about revelation, spiritual knowledge that must come to every single one of us. We must learn the doctrine of Christ. We must learn the truth of the Word of God so we do not follow after false teaching or listen to false prophets or be deceived by the false doctrines of the devil that have come forth in these last days. There is a tremendous amount of false teaching that has come forth, unfortunately. God wants you to get the Word of God in you and to get revelation of the truth and walk in it. We see in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2, also, the soul, the, the, that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. If we don't have knowledge, it's not good. We've got to have knowledge so we can make the choices and know the things that God wants for us to do so we can walk in all of his ways. We must get the knowledge of God. If we don't get the knowledge of God, we are going to see destructive effects and curses come upon us. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 17, is quite a statement. It says, If a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist, the word wist means to know. It's the word yada in the Hebrew. To know, though he knows it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. That means you're going to be guilty of not knowing the word and doing the word, walking in it, whether you know it or whether you've known the word or not, you're responsible to know it. You're guilty and you're going to bear the iniquity, the effect of it, for the sin that you might commit. Ignorance will not work. You and I are to know the word of God. And the Holy Spirit has, wants to lead us and guide us and he will bring us the truth of the word of God and bring revelation to us. We also see in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13, Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Without the knowledge of God, we'll go into captivity because Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and what gives place to him? Sin. If we don't know the word of God and walk in it, we'll walk in the flesh or walk in the ways of human nature and walk in sin instead of following the way of the word of God. And what happens? We'll end up going into captivity. In Hosea, Chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, see, and thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That's quite a statement. We've got to get the knowledge of God. He says the people are going to be destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And in this case, it's because not because knowledge didn't come to them, it's because they rejected knowledge. He said, if you reject knowledge, he said, God's going to reject you. And because you've forgotten the law of God, even it says he'll forget your children. God wants us to get the word of God in us and put the word of God first place. Now we must understand in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That was in the Old Testament hath in these last days, which is the New Testament era, spoken unto us by his Son. We are in the New Testament, 
Now we are in a better covenant with better promises, and we must understand the Word of God from the standpoint of New Testament reality, of New Covenant reality, and of what Jesus Christ has accomplished. We look at these things in the New Testament, of course, that He brings forth, but also the Old Testament is to be looked at as far as the types and shadows, what they point towards, because they are types and shadows of the spiritual realities that God has. Uh, brought forth and brought into manifestation through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Now, we need to get precise, correct, accurate knowledge. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and the desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We put the cursor over the word knowledge. If you're here for the first time in the lower window, there's information that we put up. It's got the Strong's number keyed to Strong's concordance, the Greek word or Hebrew if we're in the Old Testament, and meanings and other information that's important. This is the word epigenosis, which means precise, correct knowledge. We must have precise, correct knowledge of His will. It's got to be accurate. It's got to be exact. It can't be what we think it says or what we interpret it supposedly to be. No, it's got to be precise, accurate knowledge. And who is the one who's going to lead us and guide us and bring forth that? The Holy Spirit will bring revelation of the truth and lead us and guide us into all truth. And this is so important. And why do we need to get this precise, correct knowledge? We have tremendous problems in the body of Christ. We see many people that when there's differences, they say, well, we, I, interpret, I interpret the scripture this way, or other people interpret such and such a way is why they have differences. Uh, is that something that's right? No. Do you interpret scripture? No, absolutely not. Second Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation or anything of the scripture. No private, which means one's own interpretation. You don't make your own interpretation of the Scripture. The Scriptures are true. Every Scripture is a truth. You believe the Scriptures, and you thank the Holy Spirit for bringing a revelation of what it means, opening your eyes to see the spiritual reality of what's being said. People that interpret the Scripture are in error. You do not interpret the Scripture. You believe it, and you thank the Holy Spirit for bringing revelation to you. And in all subjects, all the scriptures are truth. They all fit together like pieces in the jigsaw puzzle to bring forth revelation of the truth. This is so important. This is why we have all these different doctrines of men, commandments of men, and things that aren't true. Because they have not looked at all the scriptures, or they have made their own interpretation of it, which is a mistake. Many reasons why we need to get exact knowledge. We'll just look at a few talking about doctrines that are false doctrines taught widely in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That is the baptism by the Holy Spirit. What does it do? It brings us into the body of Christ. When do we come into the body of Christ? When we're born again. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. Do full gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal people teach that? No. They teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a secondary experience after you're born again, which is false. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. The scripture is the truth. So we have great numbers of people that are deceived on this whole subject. And we come to the place about the Holy Spirit, of when it's received and when it's not. Many people think that the Holy Spirit's received when you're born again at that point. Not so. Acts chapter 8, verse 5, Philip preached, went down the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. Verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. That meant they were born again, and they got baptized because baptism follows having been born again. What did they get? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Did they get the Holy Spirit yet? No, the Holy Spirit is different, and it proceeds from the Father. Verse 14, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard Samaria received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. 
who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, obviously they hadn't received it yet if they're coming to pray for them to receive it. It even says in the next verse, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It makes it very clear. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is after you're born again. You see, they, the Holy Spirit had not even fallen upon them yet. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. We have whole groups of Christians, because they haven't looked at these scriptures or believed them, that are, have not received the Holy Spirit. They're born again, but they don't have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them yet. We have another whole group out there that thinks we're supposed to keep the Old Testament law. We have problems. See, it's all because of not getting the knowledge of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus spoke here about the change in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount from the Old Testament law to the New Testament law, if you understand what he's saying. Matthew 5, 43, you've heard it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Where's that from? The Old Testament. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them and hate you, pray for them that spitefully use you and persecute you. That's the New Testament. Can you hate your enemy and love your enemy at the same time? No. There's obviously a change. Are we under the Old Testament law any longer? No. We're now under the New Testament law. Yet we have a tremendous number of Christians that want to keep the Old Testament law when we're not under it. We're under the New Testament law now. But then we have the other, pe other people that say, well, we're not under law at all in the New Testament. We're under grace. We don't have to do anything. We can just do whatever we want to do. The hyper-grace type movement. It's all false as well. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Are we under law in the, old, in the New Testament? Yes. What law? The Old Testament law? No. It's the New Testament law. And what's it called? The law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. Bear you one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, this law has replaced the Old Testament law. We now are in a better covenant with better promises, and look what it says here. Romans 8, 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's the New Testament law, has made me free from the law of sin and death. The Old Testament law brought the revelation of what was sin, and of course, they couldn't do anything about it. And so it ended up to produce death. It brought condemnation to them. We see that there's a change now. The New Testament law, what does it do? James chapter 1, verse 25. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty. We're under the New Testament law, the law of liberty. In fact, that is what you and I are being judged by. James 2, 12. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. We are now into the New Testament law. Yet we have all these people keeping the Old Testament law, which is a great mistake. We also have people, even in deliverance circles, that are sending curses back to people. I hear it all the time. I talk with someone this week. We're talking about a pastor was sending curses back. That's ridiculous. That's wrong. Well, Psalms 109.17 says, As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. Send the curses back to them. Is that what we do in the New Testament? No. We already saw the scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, which we'll look at her again. It says, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. You don't return curses to a person. You bless them. That is a false teaching. We see it again in Romans chapter 12. Verse 14, bless them that persecute, bless and curse not. We shouldn't be cursing. James talks about the same mouth, blessing and cursing. This, this ought not so to be. We should only be blessing out of our mouth. So all these people that are doing that, they're in error. It is wrong. Then we have another group out there. Lots of people, whether they're Christians or Jews or Messianics, and they think that God is just one. Well, is God just one, referring to one person? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. 
God said, let us, and this is God, the word Elohim, and I want you to notice Elohim is plural in the Hebrew. It's not singular, it's plural, denoting the plurality of the Godhead. Notice what God, the plurality of the Godhead, said. Now, if he's singular, he's going to speak with singular pronouns, right? But if it's a God, talking about the whole Godhead, he's going to speak with plural pronouns. Look what it says. Let us, well, that's a plural pronoun, make man in our, another plural pronoun, image, after our likeness. Now, how can we come up with what he's, there's one when he's speaking here in a plurality? People have rejected the truth of the Word of God. We see tremendous problems in the body of Christ. And there's others, the ones that think that, well, they are of the, we were even talking about the oneness persuasion out there that think that he's just one. It's a lie. It's a lie from the devil. People, these people are totally deceived. Look what it says in John 8, 29. He that sent me is with me. Well, if someone sent you, that must be somebody else. That's another person, isn't it? The Father hath not left me alone. That's who sent him. For I always do those things that please him. Well, that means I must be pleasing another person. That's right. The Father is a person. Jesus is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. They're the three persons of the Godhead. We see in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus, he's there bodily. When he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon him. Well, that's somebody else coming, the Holy Spirit coming. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, a voice from where? From heaven. Well, where's Jesus? Is he in heaven? No, he's right there in the water. So we got a voice from heaven. Who is that? That's the Father. We got Jesus there, standing there bodily. And we have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, the three persons of the Godhead. How can people miss it? It's beyond me. They must throw their minds out the window, as far as I can see. It's as clear as a bell. John, 2 John 1, 9. Whoso transgressed and abides not in the doctrine of Christ is not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ has both. When I say both, that means two, doesn't it? It doesn't mean one. If I say both of you, we're not talking about one person, we're talking about two people. Has both the Father and the Son. Tremendous deception in these people that are oneness, and that are totally deceived. Then we have the group that says that, well, we're saved by faith alone, and that's all you got to do. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Think we're be justified, declared righteous, because of just faith only. James 2.24. You see then how that by works a man is justified, declared righteous, rendered righteous, and not by faith only or faith alone. There are great numbers of pastors and ministers that are teaching that you are declared righteous or saved and right with God by faith alone. It's wrong. First of all, what kind of works? Works of faith, not works of the flesh, not works of man. Works of faith, of doing the word of God. So we see all these people are wrong. Then we see another doctrine that's taught widely in the body of Christ, that when we're born again, we're perfectly righteous. And so we're righteous forever. Is that true? No. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is their classic scripture that they stand on. Well, that also brings us to another point. If we don't get the precise, correct, accurate knowledge of God and look up every word and find that know of the Greek and the Hebrew, we are sunk. We are going to be in error. Look what it says here. For he, speaking of the Father, hath made, and the word made is the word made, poieo, below, which means make correctly, him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, mankind who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, that we, that's mankind that would receive Jesus, then it says, might be made the righteous of God in him. Well, that sounds like it's a done deal. But you have to look up the words. The word made is not poieo. It is the word ginomai in the Greek. 
it means to become. Well, that's a big difference. If I made something, it's already done. If it's going to become, it means it's not happened yet. That, and also, this happens to be a present tense verb, meaning continuous, ongoing action. And it is a subjunctive mood verb, which is important whenever you see that, because that is a conditional statement. It conditions have to be met for it to happen. So the way you would translate this, like Young's has brought out, that we may become, on an ongoing basis, because it's present tense, the righteousness of God in him if conditions are met. If conditions aren't met, it's not going to happen. So that destroys the I'm perfectly righteous when I get born again teaching. And you don't hear the people talk about these. This is the other problem. People leave verses out. We have to get the exact knowledge of God. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Why would God say that in his word? Because the subject that he's about to discuss is an area in his foreknowledge, knowing that people would be deceived about this area. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The word doeth. We have to look up the tenses. Present tense, which means continuous ongoing action. Young's translates it correctly from the Greek, who is doing, showing the ongoingness. Who is doing the righteousness is righteous. So, that means you got to be doing righteousness continually to be righteous. What if you walk in sin? It produces unrighteousness. Are you righteous then? No, you got unrighteous. You need to confess the sin, receive forgiveness and cleansing, so you can be cleansed from the unrighteousness. The ones who are doing righteousness are righteous. So this most all the body of Christ thinks that they're perfectly righteous when they're not at the new birth. It is another false teaching. And then we have the group that thinks, well, we're saved, we're born again, and it's all set, and it's all done. Perfect one saved, always saved. No. Matthew 7, 21. You're saved as long as you're born again and following the Lord. You just stay that in that state as you walk with the Lord. Could you turn away from Him? Yes. Does that mean you're saved anymore? No. But many people, most of the people out there say it is. Look at the scripture. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that tells you something right there. You can't just say something. There's more than saying, isn't it? But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, you're doing the will of the Father, present tense, that's doing righteousness, it's right in line with what we saw. Those are the ones that are going to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that destroys it right there. People aren't doing the will of the Father, they obviously aren't going to enter in. Then we come to verse 22. Many will say to me, many doesn't mean a few, it means a whole lot. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. Now let's stop on this verse for a moment and ask the question, is this talking about an unbeliever or a believer? Most all pastors will say this is, this is unbelievers, not talking about believers. Wait a minute. Can you prophesy in his name if you're not born again? No. You've got to have the Holy Spirit have to and speak in his name being born again in his name cast out devils can you cast out demons in the name of jesus if you're not born again no you got to know your authority you got to be right with god in my name done many wonderful works can you do anything if you're not born again of doing any works of god in his name no so this is talking about believers that are born again clearly then i will profess unto them the believers that we are just discussing here. I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Well, how could this be? It's understanding how God views things. What's the state of this person? Remember, these are all past tense verbs. Have prophesied, have cast out, done. That's all in the past. It says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work this word work is in the present tense, means working, ongoing continuousness, iniquity. The word iniquity is anomia, you've got to look up the words, which means lawlessness. 
So this is saying you who are working ongoing basis lawlessness. So are they doing the will of the Father anymore? No. They've turned away from the Lord. They are now working lawlessness. Well, how does God view you? He views you at what you're doing continuously at any point in time. If you've turned away from him and you're not walking his ways anymore and you're doing lawlessness, are you going to be saved? Are you going to enter in the kingdom of heaven? No. You're going to hear, depart from me. Once saved, always saved. Teaching is a lie from the devil, deceiving the multitudes, unfortunately. It's very sad. Then we have another thing about tithing. We have a great group of Christians anymore now that are not tithing. This is why we've got to get the knowledge of God exactly. Genesis chapter 4. Here we see when the offering was being brought of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, 3. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. An offering. So that was kind of whatever he wanted to bring. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock. That is the birthright offering, which is the tithe. And we've talked about that in the past and brought the birthright scriptures up in the tithing scriptures and show it's the birthright offering is the tithe. So Abel ha brings the tithe and Cain just does whatever he wants. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering he did not respect. <laughs> he didn't have respect to it because it was disobedience to him. So, all these people that say, well, tithing was in the Old Testament, it's passed away, and now, and so we don't do that now. Well, this is before the Old Testament came into being. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, that was before the Old Testament came into being. Jacob said he was going to give the tenth to him, that was before the Old Testament came into being. So this predated it. And by the way, there's a revelation here in the Hebrew in the process of time it came to pass. This literally means it cometh to pass in the end of days. This is the word, kates, in the Hebrew it means end, and then the word yom, which means days, and it's plural. It comes to pass at the end of days. What's that tell you? That's a revelation pointing towards this same thing's going to happen at the end of the days as well as what was happening then. And we're at the end of the days, aren't we, in these days, leading to the coming of Jesus, showing the fact that people be doing the same thing, not tithing. People think it's not in the New Testament. It sure is. Jesus receives the tithes. Hebrews 7, verse 8. Here men that die receive tithes. There, that's a different place. He receiveth them of whom it's witness that he liveth. Who is the only one whose witness that he liveth is raised from the dead? Jesus Christ. Where is there? In heaven, where he's at. What does he do? He receives the tithes. Not only do you bring it to the church for the gospel to be preached, but also Jesus receives it as well. So all these people, their offerings are not received. They're cursed. They're in trouble because they're not doing what God says. And I could go on and on and on about all these different things. We've seen some major things right there of tremendous number of Christians and they got all these false things. Why is it? Because they haven't studied the Word and gotten the precise, correct knowledge of God. How do we study the Word? If we're going to study the Word, we've got to be wise. And every preacher who's supposed to bring forth the word, he's got to be wise. He's got to do what's right. Does the Bible give us some instructions? Sure does. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, and I want to be wise, I don't want to be stupid and foolish, he still taught the people knowledge. What do we teach? Knowledge. Do we tell jokes? No. Do we tell stories? No. Do we tell social sermons? No. Do we entertain you and make you feel good? No. Never. That's not what we're to do. We're to teach the people knowledge. That's why we teach you scripture after scripture, point after point, because we've got to get knowledge. How does he able to do this? He gave good heed and sought out and set in order the many proverbs, which would be all the truths on a particular subject. 
That means he's going to have to take a lot of time to look up every scripture on every subject. He's going to have to have good heed and seek out and set in order these. That's what every person who teaches the Word of God is supposed to do. And then bring forth the scriptures and teach the people knowledge thoroughly on every subject. What's going to be acceptable for him to bring forth? The preacher sought to find out what's acceptable words. What's going to be acceptable for me to bring forth to you? That which was written was upright, even words of truth. So what are we going to bring? Scripture after scripture after scripture, point after point, bring out information about what they're saying so that you get the words of truth. This is what's supposed to happen. Do we see this happening? No. We see people give a text and then just rambling or telling a story or going on and on and not teaching the people. We have a major problem in the body of Christ, I submit to you, across the board, just from the doctrines that I've shown you. I can sit here and give them to you all day long because a lack of exact, precise, correct knowledge in doing what the Word says. We are not going to make those mistakes. We are going to get the Word in us and walk in the ways of the Word of God. What's the pastor supposed to do? Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. I will give you pastors according to mine heart. What kind are his heart? Not the ones that do whatever they want to do. They shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's what has to happen. That's my responsibility. If I don't feed you with knowledge and understanding, I'm worthless. I'm going to be, I'm going to be judged severely because the one who teaches is under the greater condemnation. Knowledge and understanding is what we need to get. And if we're going to grow up in the things of God and learn these things, do we just hear one scripture, a text, and then just ramble and that's going to be good enough? No. How are you going to learn things? Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. That means they're babies that grow up, and they're not going to be spiritual babies anymore because they're going to get knowledge, and they're going to get understanding and grow up. How is this going to happen? Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, point after point after point after point. It's like just building blocks, so to speak, as the scriptures are coming forth. The Word of God has made it clear what every preacher is supposed to do. Yet, 99% of them that I know of are not doing this whatsoever. We have major problems. But we, you and I are going to get the precise, correct knowledge of God and walk in line with it. It is absolutely essential. We can't do things our way. We have to do things His way. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you have the fear of the Lord, you're going to be in a position now to receive, because you understand the knowledge of God is the truth, which I'm going to be responsible for. I'm going to be judged according to the word, what I do with it. And I've got to have the fear of the Lord, which of course means that if I don't do it, I'll see judgments come. But if I do get the knowledge of God, then I'll be blessed. I'll, so I walk in the ways of the Word of God. It's also the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the holy is understanding. We need to get knowledge of the things that are holy to have true spiritual understanding before the Lord. So what are we going to have to do? We have to get in the Word, don't we? Proverbs 2.1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. That means you've got to be in a position to hear the word, but then you're supposed to receive it and take hold of it. It's not play pick and choose. Oh, I like hearing that, but I don't want to hear that. Forget that. That's a mistake. You receive his words and hide his commandments with you. Remember, if you hide your commandments, the commandments in you, you won't sin against him, the Bible says so that you incline your ear unto wisdom and ply your heart to understanding. If you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, I mean, you're seeking after this. This is what I've got to have. If you seek for as silver and search for her as for hid treasures, I mean, hey, it's a treasure around the corner. You're going to go looking for it for sure. You're going to get after it. 
Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and shall find the knowledge of God. That means you've got to have a right art, 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 attitude of heart in order to get the knowledge of God. You're going to have to seek it. You're going to have to really look for it. You can't just, you know, well, if God wants to tell me something, fine. No. You're to go after it and find the knowledge of God and seek after it and get this word in you. What happens as the word comes to you? In the New Testament, God takes his word, he's writing it in your heart and writing it in your mind. Hebrews 8.10 This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. This is speaking in the New Testament era. Saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So here he takes his word, he's going to write it in, in your heart and mind. The opposite is said in Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. God is taking his word and writing it and putting it in your heart and in your mind. In your mind, so that you can think correctly, so that you can choose correctly. That's the area of the soulish realm. You need the word in your soulish realm. It speaks of that back in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 10. When wisdom enters into thy heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. The soul is a will, intellect, and emotion, so you'll choose right, think right, and govern your emotions in line with the word. And also, of course, you've got to apply your heart. Seek after knowledge. We need to be diligent to get in the word, hear the word, do the word, apply it in our life. Proverbs 22, 17. Bow down thine ear, hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. God wants us to apply the heart to get the knowledge of God. Now, as you get the knowledge of God, it's going to do great things for you. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9 says, A hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the just shall be delivered. You aren't going to be able to be delivered unless you have knowledge of God's ways and what he wants you to do to get delivered from situations. You want to be delivered, you get the knowledge of God, you do what he says, you follow it, and you're going to see God's deliverance come forth in your life. God wants us to lay up knowledge in us. It is to be written in our heart and mind so it's laid up within us. Proverbs 10, 14, wise men lay up knowledge. God wants you laying up knowledge. You should have the knowledge of God laid up within you so that it'll give you the desires in your heart to do the right thing and you'll know in your mind, your will, what to, how to think and to choose and to do the things that God wants for you. Also, the word is to be put in your mouth. Remember, your mouth is a releaser. Proverbs 14, 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. God's word is to be coming out of your mouth. What you speak is you're to put it in operation in your life. If he's not, something, somebody's not speaking in line with the word, God calls him a foolish man. And you're not supposed to be fellowshipping with him. You're not to be in the presence of a foolish man. No. In fact, as we get the knowledge of God in us, we want to put it in our mouth to speak things into being and use it right. Proverbs 15, 2. The, knowledge of the, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. But the mouth of fools, they just pour out foolishness. And we've got to watch the things we speak. God wants us to speak right things. And it says also in Proverbs 5, verse 2, look what he says. That thou mayest regard discretion, that thou lips may keep knowledge. God wants your lips keeping knowledge. So what's coming out of your mouth is the word of God. In fact, this is God's view about lips that speak the word. Proverbs 20, verse 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. They're precious to God for somebody that's learning to speak forth the word of God. And see, God wants you to be not only getting the knowledge in you so you walk in the ways of the Lord, but you're supposed to give it out to others. Proverbs 15, 7. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. You're to be speaking it forth. You're to be sharing the word with others. 
and getting it out to others. At the same time, you want to watch that you're only speaking right things because also the guy who has knowledge understands he can't just be speaking anything. Proverbs 17, 27, He that hath knowledge spareth his words. And a man of understanding is an excellent spirit. We want to have an excellent spirit. We are going to spare our words. Now, when you have the knowledge of God in you, tremendous things are going to happen. Proverbs chapter 4, by verse, verse 4, says, By knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious, precious and pleasant riches. The riches of Christ, the blessings of God, will come to you through the knowledge of God. A wise man is strong, and a man of knowledge increases strength. We are to be spiritually strong. And the way you're going to get strong and increase strength is by having knowledge. Without knowledge, you're not going to be strong because spiritual strength comes from God. And so it's going to be from the, spirit, the Word of God, the spiritual knowledge coming into you. Also, as you get the knowledge of God in you, without it, you're going to be all over the place. I see people all the time. They're not stable in what they believe. They're just all over the place and you, know, you never know what the way they're going to be one day from the next. Isaiah 33, verse 6. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. It is what you're to be established, the steadfastness of stability of your times, the strength of salvation. You need the wisdom and knowledge that produces stability in your life. Now, there's many Christians out there that are very, very zealous. It's great to be zealous. God wants us to be zealous. But if you're not zealous according to knowledge, you're going nowhere. Look what it says in Romans 10, too. He's speaking to the Jews here. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You can be zealous for things, and all the different religions in the world, they're all zealous for different things that they do. But if it's not according to God's knowledge, it's going nowhere. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness because they're doing what they want, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, which is what the knowledge brings you. The knowledge of God brings you the way of righteousness that you're going to walk in that will bring forth what God purposes in your life. At the same time, remember you've got an enemy, and you must know about how the devil works. Many people don't talk about the devil. We don't want to talk about the devil. We don't want to talk about good things. Sorry, you need to talk about the devil so you understand how he works so he will not get to you. 2 Corinthians 2.11 is speaking about these guys that were slow to forgive. They were supposed to forgive. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant, not knowing of his devices. You've got to know his devices. You've got to know how he works so that he does not get advantage of you. In fact, if you don't get the knowledge of God in you, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. Having the understanding darkened. That means they aren't, they aren't having a spiritual understanding. They're darkened. Being alienated from the life of God, meaning God's life won't be manifest for you, why? Through the ignorance, the lack of knowledge, this word means, through the lack of knowledge that's in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. Of course, their heart did not receive the word. You've got to have your heart open and ready to receive the word. You've got to get the knowledge of God. If you're ignorant, you'll be alienated from the life of God and your understanding will be darkened. You'll be running around like, you, like you're in the dark. And you won't be able to understand things. You won't, be able, you won't even know what's going on spiritually. And the devil can take advantage of you. In fact, many people have allowed themselves to continue in the ways of the world. God wants you out of all the things of this ways of this world. 1 Peter 1.14 As obedient children, obedient not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts, which is all these lusts of the flesh and lusts of the world, all the things in the world, lusts of the flesh, lusts of the, these things, is all of the world, not of the Father. In your ignorance, again, in your lack of knowledge. God wants you obedient, so you are not ignorant of these things. 
fact, you've got to get the word in you. It's significant. Luke wrote here, and he's writing about the things that he learned and he understood about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said in Luke 1, verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect, the word perfect is not the right word here, it is the word akribos, which means exact, accurate, exactly and accurate, what it means in the Greek. Exact, as Young's brings out, exactly. Having exact following, not understanding, it's the word parakaleo, though, which means to follow after. I don't know why they translated understanding. It's, it's wrong, flat out wrong in the Greek. Having followed, he said, of all things from the very first. This is why Young's is good. It seems good also to me, having followed from the first after all things exactly. That's what God wants. We have to follow things exactly. If you don't follow things exactly, things aren't going to happen. You have a combination and you, to your lock and you're going to open it up. If you don't follow those numbers exactly, guess what? It's not opening. <laughs> you can try anything you want. It's not going to work. Or you have directions, A, B, C, D, and then it will work. And you don't do one of them or don't do it right. It's not going to happen, is it? We must do things exactly. And we must follow the Word of God exactly in the Word of God. Can we know it? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to us, but we have to study the Word of God. And we have to know the Word of God. We have to look at every single scripture on it. We can't leave anything out. And we've got to believe the scripture and thank Him for giving revelation to understand what it's saying. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Why weren't they awaking to righteousness? Why were they continuing to sin? Because they didn't have the knowledge of God. If you have the knowledge of God, then you can walk in the ways of the Lord and you won't sin. And you will awake to righteousness. He speaks it to these guys. The Corinthian church had lots and lots of problems. And he says, I speak this to your shame. How come you haven't gotten the knowledge of God and awakened to the way of righteousness? They were continuing in all kinds of sin areas. Romans. Chapter 15, God wants you filled with knowledge. Look what he says about the Roman church. They were a church that was known outstanding for their faith, tremendous faith, and their obedience. He said, I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. They were filled with the knowledge of God. These guys got in the Word. They studied the Word. They got the word in them. They weren't lazy at all whatsoever. The knowledge of God is also so important for you because you've got to govern what comes into your mind. The thoughts that come into your mind, you must govern them. Is every thought that comes into your mind from the Lord? No. It could be coming from the devil. It could be coming from the flesh. It could be coming from... Uh, anything else that would try to get worldly philosophies, all these kind of things that come to you? No, we can't have that. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we are told to cast down imaginations, which means mental reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Otherwise, it's trying to raise itself above what the knowledge of God, what the Word of God says, so that you'll follow it instead of following the Word. You can't do that. And you are to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Otherwise, the thoughts that come in your mind, are you governing them and seeing whether they're in line with the Word? Is this in line with the Word or not? This isn't from the Lord. This isn't from the, you know, this is not from right, right in line with the Word. I'm going to cast that down. I'm not going to give place to that. I'm going to bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ, what the Word says. And having a readiness, this means prepared and ready to revenge all disobedience. You've got to realize the devil's attacking your mind. You've got to be ready to a revenge this means to, to come against, avenge the enemies, their disobedience, disobedient thoughts. How does that happen? When your obedience is fulfilled. 
This is a very important area of obedience for you. When you get the knowledge of God in you, you need to make sure that you're governing your mind by taking your thoughts captive, casting down anything that's fighting against or trying to raise itself against the knowledge of God. Absolutely imperative. Otherwise, you're going to be having all kinds of problems in your mind. If you don't govern your mind with the Word of God, I guarantee you, you're all over the place and you'll be listening to things left and right that aren't of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. What's their purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, or to grow up, or go on into growing up in the com completion of the saints, furnishing, equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come. This is what God's will is for every one of us. We all come in the unity of the faith and of the epigenosis, precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man who has come to perfection. We are to go on to perfection, the Word says. As you get taught the Word of God, as it says, and you come to the place of the complete furnishing of you, the work of the ministry, edifying, you, this is what you're carrying out, you're edified and ministering to others as well. We're all to come to the unity of the faith and the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God to the perfect man. Meaning if you don't get the precise, correct knowledge, you'll never get to the perfect man. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, this is what God is raising up, the holy nation, the mighty army of the Lord, the glorious church, the holy church that is going forth in these last days. Look at the attitude that Paul had. Remember Paul, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Hebrew above Hebrews. He was, he was educated top-notch. <laughs> but when he came to the Lord, everything had to change. He says in verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything else means nothing. i got to have the knowledge of God for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Otherwise, I've got to get in line with the knowledge of God and walk in it. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, that's what they were doing in the Old Testament, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. What's going to happen as you get the knowledge of God? You're going to know him. You're going to know him, you're going to know his ways, you're going to know all about him. He reveals himself unto you through the word. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, you die out to everything that's of the flesh and the world and turn away from it. You're going to walk now in this new way. That by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's quite a statement. He's saying that if I, I got to do these things that I might attain. Otherwise, it wasn't a done deal. It wasn't already that he was going to be there. This is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning it was a conditional statement that I might attain if the conditions are met under the resurrection of the dead. This guy is a born-again guy writing all these things, and he hasn't attained to it. That means it's not a done deal when, just because you're born again. He had to attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained. Nope, he hadn't. Either we're already perfect. Understand, he understood where you're heading to. Perfection, to attain to this. But I follow after, which means I'm running after. I'm running swiftly in order for, to get to something. If you're just passive in your Christian life and not seeking God with everything within you, there's something wrong. You should be zealous. You should be running after in order to find. I follow after that I may lay hold of, apprehend means lay hold of, catalambano, lay hold of that for which I have been laid hold of Christ. He bought you. You belong to him. Now you are to go and lay hold of all the things that he has provided for you. Brethren, I count not myself to have laid hold of things, but this one thing I do. I'm forgetting the things that are behind. 
Uh, they, they don't do me any good. And I'm reaching forth of the things that are before. I am moving forth according to the knowledge of God for the things that are before. I press, which means I'm running after, running swiftly toward the goal. The goal or the end in view, which was perfection and to make it for the resurrection of the dead and to be everything that God wants. For the prize, this is the award to the victor. You have to get the victory. The one who victors, conquers and carries off the victory inherits all things. And God wants you to, you're to conquer over sin, conquer the devil, conquer the flesh, conquer the world, conquer everything. You're able to do it through God's power and his work in your life. For the prize of the high calling of God. There's a high calling of God. It's upon every one of our lives. It's the calling to go on to become like Jesus, to go on into perfection, to get to the place of being holy without spot, without blemish, unrebukable, unreprovable in his sight. That's where we're headed. And he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect, to be perfect. That's where we're headed to. All these people who say, well, we're never going to get to perfection. They're not telling you the word. They're telling you false teaching. Be thus minded. And if any be thus otherwise minded, God will reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we've already attained what you've already come to in your Christian walk, you're supposed to continue in it. Let us walk by the same rule. Keep walking. Otherwise, keep it in operation. It should be your lifestyle. You just didn't do something and then go back to something else. No. You learn these things to walk in it continually. This is your lifestyle. Let us mind the same thing. He wants your mind renewed to the mind of Christ through the Word so you think and He wants and do the things He wants. Brethren, be followers together with me and mark them which walk as you have us for an example. People that are walking that walk, they're a good example. You need to be an example so people looking at you see you an example. For many walk. Yeah, this is trouble. This isn't a few, remember. This is the many. Of whom I've told you often and now even tell you weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. What's that all about? The cross of Christ is where something is put to death. And what's supposed to be put to death? All the deeds of the body, all the works of the flesh, anything that is not of the Lord, eliminated from your life. It's all to be wiped out. Whose end is destruction. Hmm, they aren't saved. Whose God is their belly. They're letting their body run them. Whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. Their mind's not set on the things they should. Your mind's supposed to be set on the things above, right? If you be risen with Christ, set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. We are not to let ourselves have mind earthly things. God wants us to get the precise, correct knowledge of God in us and begin to walk in it so that we attain to the resurrection of the dead. We go on into perfection, as he said. And he said, I haven't, I haven't attained yet, but I'm going to get there. I'm going to run swiftly. I'm running that race. I am going after everything that God has for me. That's the attitude you want. If you're not zealous for the things of God, you need to light a fire under you so that you are seeking God with everything within you and putting him first place in your life. Colossians 1.5 For the hope, that's the confident expectancy, el peace, which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, the words come to you, the gospel, and brings forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth. It's the favor of God to you. And when you hear of it, why is it working in you to bring forth fruit? Because they were doing it. How do you bring forth fruit? By doing the word. As you get the knowledge of God, do it. Hear it and do it. Hear it and do it. Hear it and do it. Get it in and incorporate it into your lifestyle. So important. And we saw this earlier when we looked at verse 9, that we're to be filled with the precise, correct knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What's the purpose of that? Just so you can get a bunch of blessings or get a bunch of knowledge and know some things and facts? No. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. 
Remember, we talked about your spiritual walk the last time. Your spiritual walk is so important. We talked about that in the last three messages. Might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Not once in a while. Every good work. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Because the more knowledge you get, the more you're going to know Him, the more you're going to know His ways, the more you're going to be doing the Word, the more fruit's going to come forth, the more you're going to walk before Him, being fruitful and walking worthy before the Lord. What else is going to happen? You're going to be strengthened with all uh, power. Dunamis is the word. Empowered with all power. According to His glorious power, the power of His glory that operates in you. Unto all steadfastness. Patience means steadfastness. And that's of the soul. He wants you steadfast in your mind. And long-suffering with joyfulness. Long-suffering in the face of whatever circumstance you're dealing with. Yes, you have to conquer the enemy. You're going to be long-suffering in the face of things that haven't changed yet, but you keep pressing through. God wants you to get this knowledge, see? Colossians 2, 2. He says that their heart might be comforted, being knit together in love, and in, to, into all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the, it says acknowledgement here, but it's not a good translation, to the epigenosis, precise and correct knowledge of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ. This is a mystery. Remember all these mysteries? The mystery of faith, the mystery of the kingdom of God. It's given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom. We're to know all these mysteries. They're all revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. To the precise, correct knowledge of the mystery of God. That you, because, you know, to people that are out there aren't going to know anything. It's only those people that are walking in the way of the Lord that are going to learn these things. Colossians 3.8 Put off all these. You do have to get rid of things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He wants it all put away. And he goes on and says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Anything of the old man, get rid of it. That's the human nature, flesh. The way you used to think, the way you used to react, deal with situations. We put that all away. Put it off. And you put on the new man. How do you put on the new man? Which is renewed in precise, correct knowledge. You have the new man put on you in the measure that you have precise, correct knowledge in you and working in your life that you're hearing and doing. If you don't, you don't have the new man on. You might be walking according to the old man continually. And that's going to destroy you left and right. You're to be renewed in knowledge. God wants you to get the knowledge of God and get the word in you. This is why the prayers that were being prayed, like in Ephesians 1, verse 16, cease not to give thanks for you, make and mention my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the precise, correct knowledge of Him. Why was he praying that? Because this is what they need. So they can walk in the ways of the Lord, so they can overcome, so they can conquer everything, so they can become like Jesus. That is what God wants. Now, at the same time, you got to be wise to know the Word so you don't fall after any of the false doctrines. We just gave you a few of the ones, just briefly, of why we need to get the precise, correct knowledge of God. But look what it says here. 1 Timothy 4.1 The Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times, and we are in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The devil has doctrines. What are they? Anything that's not the truth. So if you've got six doctrines on some subject, you know at least five of them are doctrines of the devil, and one of them might be the truth, depending upon whether it's right or not. Doctrines of devils. We cannot allow these kinds of things to come. We have to get rid of all, all this. God wants us to get the word in us. Here's, if you don't have the word in you, you're not going to be able to perceive things. Remember, it's like your, your understanding is darkened. You won't be able to see things. Look what's spoken here in Matthew 17, verse 12, what he said. Jesus is saying to them, And I say unto you that Elias... Elijah, he's talking about, is come already, and they knew him not. They didn't, they didn't epigonosco, they didn't become thoroughly, have this precise, correct knowledge to know, is the verb form, knew him not.
but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Who's he talking about? John the Baptist. They just rejected him. That's what he's talking about. He was the one who was the forerunner, remember, that came before Jesus. And so, if they, you don't get the precise correct knowledge, you won't know stuff. You'll be in the dark. You'll be deceived so easily. God does not want us to be deceived whatsoever. And so, and especially if we don't have people that are getting the word in them, and people that are speaking of themselves, we have problems. False prophets, false teachers, false brethren, the Bible speaks of. They are out there. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like they're the real thing, but they're not. Inwardly, they're ravening wolves. How do you know them? By their fruits. Look at the fruits in their life. Look at the fruits of what they say. If it's not in line with the Word of God, there's a problem. We're to search the Scriptures to see if the things are so or not. We cannot allow any of this false stuff to come to us whatsoever. Otherwise, it's going to lead us down a path of destruction. Another thing. If you are going to come out of any bondages, or you're trying to help someone come out of bondages, Many people say, well, I'll just pray for you and all your problems will be gone. <laughs> no. You're the servant of the Lord and you're ministering to someone. 2 Timothy 2.24 Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient, and meekness instructing those <clears throat> that oppose themselves. So you're going to give them the word. They're opposing themselves. Why? Because they're not walking in line with the word. If God peradventure will give them repentance, which he will if they change their mind, to the, again, not the right word, precise, correct knowledge, epigenosis of the truth. Give them repentance to understanding the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, which means they would turn, they would change their mind. They would not continue to oppose themselves by walking in anything contrary to the word and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. In other words, a person has to come to repentance and correct themselves and come in line with the word before they're going to come out of captivity. Well, just pray for me to get rid of my problem. Well, how would you get your problem? And what do you know about what the word says or what you're to do to overcome this problem? And have you dealt with the situation? Have you made the changes and so forth? And you get to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil as you act on the word, see? But the people have to come to the knowledge of God. And that is so important. In fact, when you come to the knowledge of God and you start doing the word, that's the key. Many people are wanting other people to do everything for them. That's a mistake. John 3, 21, look what it says. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Not one who just heard truth, but one who was doing truth. And he just didn't do it for a second. He's doing it continuously. Present tense. Continuous, ongoing action. Otherwise, he's making this his lifestyle. We talked, we brought messages not too long ago about, do you have a spiritual track record? If you don't have a spiritual track record of walking in line with the Word, there's problems. We need to be doing the Word continually. Doing the truth continually will bring you to the light. And what happens when you continually are doing the word? You're going to see God do great things. Then said Jesus to the Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That would be a disciplined one. He's incorporated it into his lifestyle. What's going to happen then? You shall know the truth. Remember, knowing the truth is because you're doing the truth. He that doeth the truth comes to the light. You'll know the truth. You'll get the revelation of it. The light will come. And then what? The truth shall make you free. Many people think, I'm just going to learn facts and that that brings me to the truth. Not according to the word. It's when you continue in the word and become a disciplined one at your lifestyle. Then you're going to know the truth. And then that truth will make you free. Without correction and coming to the place of, of making the word your lifestyle in all areas, you're not going to get to the place of being free in your life. Now, if you heard the truth and you didn't walk in the way of the Word, but you sinned, 
Are you going to be able to get out of any judgments? No. Hebrews 10, 26. If we willfully, sin willfully after we've received the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. We did receive it. This is the word lambano. We did take hold of this precise, correct knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation will devour their adversaries. In other words, God expects us to walk in the word that we have received and taken hold of. We don't just receive, take hold of it, and then cast it aside, and then quit. No. Many people do that because they want to, oh, I need it for my problem to get solved, and then they cast it aside and go right back into doing other things. No. You're going to be judged. If we sin willfully after we know this. Romans. Look what happened to these guys. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, these are people that knew God at some point. So they had the word in them. They glorified him not as God. Don't ever stop glorifying God. They weren't thankful. Don't always ever stop being thankful to him. If you do, you become vain in the imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. It won't always be lightened if you don't continue in doing what the Word says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into like corruptible man, into birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. They're obviously darkened in their mind, lost their mind way out in left field. It's amazing how people can get to this. And God gives them up to the uncleanness of the lust of their hearts. They changed the truth of God into a lie. How did they do that? Because they didn't walk in the knowledge of God anymore. They had, they had a replacement. They changed it. Now they're going to believe something else. Worship and serve the creature more than the creator. That led them down a road of destruction because God will give them up to vile affections, and they got involved in homosexuality and all these evil things, and it led them down a path of destruction. God wants us to make sure that we are glorifying Him, we are thankful of Him, we are always walking in His ways, doing what He says. Second Peter, chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through or in the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you in, more scripturally, the precise, correct knowledge of God. Do you want God's grace, favor, and His peace for you? It's not automatic. It comes as you are getting the knowledge of God and doing it, incorporate it in your life. According as his own divine power is given to us all things that pertain into life and godliness through, this is, the precise, correct knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. As you're walking in line with the knowledge of God. And what's that going to do for you? So you can possess the promises of God so you can become like him. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. See, if you start walking in the knowledge of God, you're not going to walk in the world anyway, or the ways of lust. No. And you're going to become a partaker of the divine nature as you're possessing the promises. Possessing the promises not so I get a blessing. Possessing the promises is so you become like Jesus. And you will get all the blessings in the same time. You want to become like Him. Be a partaker of the divine nature. He comes down to verse 8. He says, If these things be in you and abound, they make you neither barren nor unfruitful in the precise, correct knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is he talking about? The things that he mentioned prior to this, which is, add to your faith virtue, which is moral excellence, knowledge, temperance. Temperance is self-control of the flesh. So you do not let the flesh run you, period. Patience is steadfastness, which is of the soulish realm. Mind, will, emotions, steadfast. Godliness, one who's come to the place being conformed to godly ways, because he's a hearer and a doer of the word. Brotherly kindness, walking in love toward the brotherhood. And charity, which is agape love, 
love towards all. If these things are in you and abounding, not just a little bit, you're supposed to have more and more and more and more in them, they're not going to make you barren or unfruitful in the precise, correct knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things, if he doesn't have them, because he obviously hasn't been doing the Word, he's blind. You won't be able to see spiritually. You won't be able to see what's going on. Spiritually, you're going to be blind. And cannot see afar off. He's forgotten he was purged from his old sins. And then he makes quite a statement here. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election. This is the word for being cho chosen, for choosing. Your calling and your being chosen, or choosing. Sure. Otherwise, it's not sure. Unless you do what's necessary to make it sure. Many are called, few are chosen, right? Why? They didn't make their calling election sure. For if you do these things, if you are doing these things, lifestyle, present tense, ongoing action, you shall never fall. What this says is you might never fall. Not a good translation to King James. You might never fall. You still could if you quit doing the word. But the point is, if you are doing the word, you will not fall. God does not want us to fall. He'll keep us from falling, as the Bible says. He'll keep you from falling and bring you into everything that he has for you. What does God want? 2 Peter 3, verse 18. He wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He wants you to grow in knowledge. You need the knowledge of God. In fact, it's very interesting what it says in James. This is where he wants to bring you and I to. He just wants you just to get a little knowledge and know a few things. No. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? I put the cursor over the word endued with knowledge. It's one Greek word only used one time in the New Testament. It's this word epistemony, which means one having the expert, having the knowledge of an expert. God wants you to be an expert. You know, on your job, whatever thing you're proficient at, you kind of become an expert at you need to be able to do it excellently. Well, you need to get the knowledge of God in you the same way. You're an expert. A knowledge of an expert. You know things inside and out. You know it all. You understand all these doctrines and you can explain all these things and share all these things. You need to know the Word of God. That means we're going to have to spend the time in it. And one last scripture, 1 John chapter 5. What is going to be the result of all these things? Remember what it said before. We know the Son of God has come, and He's given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. We are in Him that is true, even as the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. He wants you to come to know Him, to get an understanding. You're going to know Him. You're going to become like Him. But it'll never happen without the knowledge of God. Getting the knowledge of God in you, getting it established in you, hearing and doing and hearing and doing the word consistently in all areas is what every one of us are to have. That means this is number one priority for you in your life. Get the word in you, be a doer of it, walk in it, carry it out. You won't walk in sin, you won't walk in the ways of the world, you won't walk in the ways of the flesh. You're going to grow up in all things. You're going to conquer all sin areas. You're going to put off the old man, put on the new man. You're going to get rid of all the stuff that's not of the Lord. You're going to become like Jesus. You're going to possess the promises and be a partaker of the divine nature. You are going to come to the place of knowing Him. That's what Paul said, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, as He conformable unto His death, as He's dying out to everything that's not of the Lord. I'm running after that I might attain to this resurrection. I'm running after for this goal, the end result, for the victor of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we want our calling and election made sure. If you do all these things, then you won't fall, and you'll see God will bring forth everything that he purposes for you in your life. We're going to go on to perfection, we're going to become like Jesus. 
We're going to possess the promises. We're going to conquer everything. You're a conqueror. You don't, nothing, you're not going to bow down to anything. You're not going to let anything overtake you. You're going to conquer everything. God wants you to have victory, and he will bring it forth. And you're going to know him and become like him. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of the necessity of obtaining the precise, correct knowledge of the Lord. I will get in the Word. I will study the Word. I will learn the Scriptures on every subject. I will incorporate it into my lifestyle, being a doer of the Word I hear consistently, and I will come to the place of having the mind of Christ, and I will conquer every enemy, possess every promise, walk in victory, get the knowledge of God, and go on to perfection, becoming like Jesus. I thank you. I'm putting the word first place, and I am going to get the knowledge of God. Every day of my life, I will feed myself the word, and I will be a doer of it, and I will see the fruit come forth. Thank you. As I'm obedient, I will obtain the precise, correct knowledge of God, and I will see the Word of God accomplish everything that God purposes for me in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Without knowledge, we're sunk. But if we have the wrong knowledge, as we brought out many of these false things, we're on the wrong path. We got problems in the body of Christ. And this is not to be down, cutting down people, it's just pointing out truths. If things aren't right, then there's something wrong. We can know the truth. God will bring forth the revelation of it. We got to study the word and know it exactly. You can't just believe it because so and so says it. Well, so and so says such and such. Well, look over here, so and so says another thing. Well, you're going to go nowhere if you're looking at that. You got to know it yourself. Praise God for the work that he's doing in your life. Father, I thank you. We all will be hearers and doers of the word and get the knowledge of God, and we will be doers of it and see the fruit of it in our life and know the Lord and become like him. We thank you for the possessing of the precise, correct knowledge of God in our life and all that you're going to accomplish for every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.